all these experts, professionals, each of who has been doing a lot of work in specific areas. Why don't we have a single question thrown at all of them? I think that the Titanic didn't have enough of those life quotes. A lot of time that we are actually going through as a shift away from carbon emissions is traditional diesel engine car. The next session that we are going to have is called Titanic session. The theme for the session is Are we rearranging deck chairs while the ship is sinking? For this, I would humbly invite Mr. Narasimhan Santanam, Rudra Ramesh, K. Subramanian, Sivaram Pillai, and Satya Chakravarti. Please come on the stage. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, well, lots of sessions, lots of feedback. Uh, lots of chats going on outside, so I thought I'll get some things. Uh, I, go, I thought I'll get things a bit more exciting. We have um, four really good folks over here, and this is something I put up just about three, four days back. And the motivation was very simple. We have all these, um, all these experts, professionals, each of who has been doing a lot of work in specific areas. Why don't we? have a single question thrown at all of them, even though all of them will be in other sessions. Mridula will be there tomorrow in water. Subramanian just finished this electric vehicle thing. Sivram will be there in materials tomorrow. And uh, well, Satyanarayanan, uh, he is here most of the time. He is from IIT Madras. So um, they're all there somewhere else in the event. But I thought it will be good to have them for about 20, 30 minutes answering just one question. So. Somebody asked me who is the moderator for this. Actually, there's no moderator. I'm just going to throw the question and I'm going to listen to you guys as they answer. And the question is very simple. So I'm going to ask them and sit there and listen. Before that, let me quickly introduce, even though uh, many of you may be, uh, uh, some of them may be familiar to you. Mridula is um, part of Chennai Angel. She is um, she's, uh, one of the key drivers in Chennai Angel. But besides that, she's also part of Sundram Climate uh, Initiative. She has been doing a lot of sustainability related research for a long time. And she also is a director at uh, Sundaram Textiles in Madurai. She has been, more than anything else, focusing a lot on the water sector. Uh, her recent book, Watershed, has really been a watershed when it comes to uh, a book on water sustainability in India. So that's Mridula for you. Done a lot of work in sustainability, specifically in water. Subramanian, you just um, heard him um, the, being the moderator. He is an IIT alum himself. He is a distinguished IIT alumnus. Uh, he has been uh, a CEO of multiple companies before joining Ashok Leyland, where he is the SVP, and he has been driving a lot of initiatives there. And Ashok Leyland has been at the forefront of electric vehicles in India, especially the larger vehicles. Satya Narayanan, for those from IITM, he needs hardly an introduction. Mama, as we all know him here, he has been um, well, the founder of many, many startups, founder, advisor, mentor, six to seven startups, and he has been a key part of the IIT innovation ecosystem. Uh, he also happens to be my senior from IIT Madras, uh, aerospace engineering. And he has been with IIT as a professor for uh, probably a couple of decades now. So that's, that's Satya for you. And Sivram is from a slightly different industry, uh, but he has done uh, as much work as others have in his field. He is from Proclean. Proclean is a pioneer in green chemicals in India, and Sivram has a PhD in uh, uh, biotech microbiology, and his firm has done some really exciting work in the context of probiotics, biotechnology for green chemicals. So what I know, and he can explain more when he talks, hopefully, um, they have been one of the few in the country to crack the really green chemicals and bring it to a certain scale. So his, his firm does green chemicals for the consumer sector, that is the, that is the household uh, chemicals, that we cleaning chemicals we use, um, for industrial sector, for pulp, for paper, uh, for a few others. Very few in the entire country from what I know. So we have four people over here, each distinguished in his or her own field, done a lot of deep work. So I think it's a question that's very appropriate for them. And that's something Ashok Junjanwala spoke about in the morning, excellent session, where he said, Look, this is all fine. Okay, climate fix is also a good idea, but eventually, if you want to make an impact, as you said, there are three or four dimensions where we have to really make an impact for the world to become 
climate stable without much more ado i am going to throw a question at them we are all talking about innovations in this summit we have maybe 200 sitting here 700 outside i am not able to get them inside i have tried my best so a lot of people over here i'm talking about innovations each of these people has done a lot of work themselves either in innovation or have been very close to innovation but are we scratching the surface or are we really doing something that is going to make an impact when it comes to decarbonization emissions reduction the world is still emitting a lot more emissions than what it has been in the last few years 36 billion ton 37 billion tons last year it could be even higher this year which means it's a record is the highest ever so regardless of what we um, um, what we do as exciting in innovation is it impactful i don't know the question to all you guys and assessor i'm going to sit and listen are we rearranging the deck chairs while the titanic is sinking that is the question the titanic here is the world we are in deep trouble many of us are doing a lot of work but is it meaningful high impact work or is it going to be worth very little so um each of you can talk maybe 5 minutes and then we can have you know each of you asking questions to each other and when it gets too late these people will tell us that we have to finish it yep so why don't we start maybe with mrudula and we then we go around you guys need a mic or something um well, thank you narsi um, thanks for the true believers who are still in the auditorium listening to us while you are hungry um so i think we are talking about rearranging deck chairs on the titanic but the one thing that the titanic didn't have enough of was lifeboats so um uh, i'll talk about three things which we can do better one is definitely policy and i think in india the policy around carbon is excellent um the policy around adaptation is not good enough um so for instance uh you know uh, dr shivram and here works on making you know chemicals um, the water you know in industrial effluent much more treatable because it makes uh, degradable microbial enzymes i'm an investor by but anyway uh but if you look at policy in water it's not there at all so any startup that's coming there has to not even mention the word climate adaptation or water or agri tech or whatever so while you may say we are we adhering the deck chairs on carbon adaptation is not already there and look the titanic is sinking i mean even if you stop all emissions today the world is going to warm so you have to have adaptation that means you have to have to have life boats on the uh, uh, titanic and we don't have those at all okay that's number one number two i see other familiar investors here um, and i think the investors i should like to speak to have left the room so maybe i'm not uh, uh mentioning this i think um please understand climate i see a lot of big checks being written without really understanding the problem that you're trying to solve and th the problem is i still believe we are in the early part of the s curve as far as climate tech investment is concerned so even though we're st scratching the surface it comes very important how we scratch the surface because you're really sh shaping the surface as you're scratching it so very stupid checks come start getting written now you're really influencing the trajectory of the space and um, that might really push the titanic deeper into the ocean um third thing i'm really scared about green washing um i'm seeing a lot of startups very confident old young i mean i'm seeing a lot of different ages in climate tech so um yeah i'm seeing a lot of green washing and i'm really afraid of that thanks yeah okay um i'm going to just basically keep myself uh, to mobility i'm not going to talk about other aspects of um, carbon uh, the carbon threat if you want to call that the climate stuff um so the paradigm that we are actually going through as a shift away from carbon emissions is electrification um which is talking about uh, battery operated vehicles and um where does the energy come from and then of course there is also the hydrogen story that's happening and the fuel cells 
and so on. But the question is like, where is the energy for all of these things coming from? And the implicit assumption is that uh, we will probably get solar to do this, right? So let's actually look at that as the overarching, you know, paradigm shift where we are going more towards electrification and hydrogen away from carbon, and then we are talking about getting all of this from solar and maybe some of it is wind, wind and so on. And there are then we have to actually bother about you know. Uh, are we having recycling of um, batteries? What is the carbon footprint of batteries and their recycling? And what about the solar panels and their carbon footprint? So all of those things are, you know, up for grabs for people to talk, um, you know, until the cows come home, right? That's that's being uh, talked about forever. Let's assume that that is that is sorted out. I don't know if that's actually sorted out or not. I'm supposed to be. Um, a energy expert myself, but I have been going through lots of journal papers and then there are conflicting reports. We don't know what the hidden agendas of these different people that are putting out these reports are. So we, we, we are in a huge transition here where we don't know exactly the final answers, right, as far as this paradigm shift is concerned. But let's look at what's going on on the road, on the, on, on the ground. If you are actually going to replace all your so there are three things that actually um, I came across for the mobility transmit transition that's happening on the road one is the electrification the second is um, not nothing to do with climate change as such but a couple of other things um, uh, the other one is uh, driverless cars or autonomous vehicles the third one is um, aggregation models as opposed to ownership models now the last part the ownership versus aggregation could mean that we are having lesser number of vehicles um, that are being owned, um, but we have shared mobility, so the same vehicles are actually being used. There is a better capacity utilization. It simply means that we will not need many parking lots anymore, or we don't have to park our vehicles um, in front of our homes or whatever it is. But all of these kinds of transitions that we are seeing on the road are not doing anything to actually remove congestion on the road. So, so long as we're actually getting stuck in traffic on the road, there is nothing that's actually happening in terms of volumes that will change the paradigm. So it's one thing to say, go from you know fossil fuels to electric and then use solar and all that stuff. But finally, the bottom line is we are actually seeing crowded roads all the time. And so long as we are actually getting stuck in the traffic, all the time, we are using more and more energy, no matter what form it is. And the more energy that we're using, <coughs> we are actually taxing the planet in some sense or the other. So we have to actually get a lot more efficient. There are two ways of actually handling the situation. One is we can say, oh, no, 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 I think we need to actually have a lifestyle change. We have to embrace more public transport. We all have to actually walk better, go to the nearest bus stop and have electric buses. You know, that, that's, that's one way of handling things. But in, in some sense, it's sort of like telling us, hey, s slow down. You don't need to uh, be rushing all the time, going out everywhere, and uh, just stay at home and, and so on, which is actually aided by a lot of your uh, Zoom calls and, and, and so on. So people actually don't have to travel as much as they used to in the first place. So that's kind of like putting brakes on the need to travel and so on. So these are all like very natural ways of you know, handling the situation, uh, like, like a demand supply balance is coming up. But it also kind of tells us, hey, maybe we, need, we, need, we shouldn't be advancing as much as we are doing. We should actually regress back to a, a more laid back civilization or something like that. I'm not sure if we are actually cut out for that at all. We are unfortunately going in an irreversible uh, direction where we need to do more and more with less and less. That's actually the, the situation. Then. What is this? What is what is this? Deck chairs and the Titanic and all that stuff. The simple answer is in one word called leapfrog. Is that a way by which we can leapfrog in technology instead of thinking of more of the same? So thinking about a, a, a electric car or a driverless car or electric two wheeler and all these things are essentially trying to replace one with the other. But is that a way by which we can leapfrog? So that's actually where I'm, what I'm doing makes sense to me, at least. Uh, we, we can sit and debate this 
uh, over lunch or whatever it is. So we did actually carbon emissions, uh, you know, um, kind of thing for something like our taxis. So is it possible for us to get off the road in the first place and then use up the vertical volume completely? And you have like theoretically infinite volume up there so that you can actually fly one over the other. We don't have to actually f compete for the same surface that we are stuck on. And we did a calculation on what if we were to theoretically replace the kind of volumes that are required that is serviced by a certain number of existing taxis in a city, in a typical city. Let's say something like about 12,000 taxis are servicing something like about one lakh trips a day. And if all of them were to be done by planes instead of cars, why is that important? We are essentially talking about like a much higher throughput of volume. What, can, what takes about one and a half to two hours for people to actually get stuck in traffic to get can be done in about 10 minutes, which means that on a per day, you actually are pushing more people and, uh, uh, and, 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 and clocking more kilometers. So, or put it another way, let's assume that the number of people and the number of kilometers have to be done is only the same. You need far fewer aircraft when compared to the number of cars that are there. So if, if like 12,000 taxis are there, you'll probably need less than about 1,000 planes to do this. And of course, you can ask the question, oh my god, there's 1,000 planes, they're all actually going to be crowding the skies and, and all that stuff. That's, th that is exactly the leapfrogging uh, part about, right? We have to actually invest in technologies that are qualitatively different than what we're doing today. Unless we do this, right, we are just doing more of the same. That's actually the rearranging the deck charts that you're talking about. The next thing that I would like to talk about is Hyperloop. That's another thing that we are saying, right? Where we are talking about going from Chennai to Bangalore in 15 minutes or 20 minutes. All of it actually trying to be done with solar panels, which have enough real estate over the tube to power. And we have done power calculations to find out that this is actually going to guzzle much less power when compared to a, a, a similar uh, such thing that you would do with, like, let's say, a high speed train or a, or a maglev train or whatever it is. And these are, again, things where we have to talk about like a, 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 a step change in the way we think about it. So typically, in the, la in, the, in, the, in the 20th century, we have always been used to saying, if you want to go faster, namely, let's say, by aircraft, you will actually emit a lot more, right? Aircraft today actually emit a lot more on, on a per passenger basis. So we are fortunate that we are not flying as, as much as we are, <coughs> we, are, we are actually going on the road. Right, the, the aviation emissions are only about two percent of the entire carbon mix, when compared to like road emissions for both passengers and cargo. That's probably doing maybe about 40 40 percent each kind of thing. Right, so like about eighty percent of the transportation is road emissions. Right, and, and and the aviation emissions are much less. But if you look at on a per passenger basis, aviation is actually pretty horrendous. That's because of a a technology from the twentieth century where we are burning more carbon in order to actually go faster. Right? And we are trying to break that cycle. We are basically saying we need to get much smarter technologies that will break the cycle and say we can get greener for moving people faster. And, and that's where, again, we have a like lot more throughput with much greener technologies. So I think the summary here is unless we are looking at leapfrogging with completely new technologies than just trying to do more of the same, we will be rearranging deck chairs <laughs> right uh, when the Titanic is sinking. Sure. Just wanted to take off from uh, where uh, Professor Satya left off, and I think we are thinking along exactly the same lines. So, once again, Subramanian Ashok Leland, um, we did something very simple. We today have telematics units in all our vehicles that are running on the road. They have a whole bunch of sensors. They have, uh, they are transmitting data to the cloud from every single vehicle. So we have access to that kind of data. We did something very simple. We took a traditional diesel engine truck and we kind of plotted where all the power is going, right? And as expected, most of the power is actually, a big fraction is lost in the engine because the engine is very inefficient. Right? So the engine is about 38% efficient, which means that 62% is actually lost. Right? And then you have transmission, you have various other things. Right? Because the engine is this elephant in the room, 
everything else looks small in comparison. Now, if you move to electric, right, apart from the fact that it's cool technology, it's green and all that, it, it shows you something very interesting in the data because now you don't have the engine at all, right? It actually shows you that the biggest source of losses, 40%, believe it or not, is tires. And very interestingly, almost nobody is working on tires. Right? Maybe because it's looked insignificant in the past, but really, truly, to repeat, 40% of the power from the battery in an electric vehicle goes into tires. Roughly another 20% goes into transmission losses. And what is transmission? There is something called a propeller shaft. There is a universal joint. There is a gearbox. There is a clutch. There is a differential, which adjusts the speed difference between the left and right wheel. And then there are a lot of other miscellaneous ones. But if you look at the end of that pie chart, right? how much power actually reaches the wheel, you'll be shocked. It's about 2%. 2% of battery power reaches the wheel, which kind of gives you a completely different thought process, a leapfrog, just to use the same word. right? It says that if you work Forget the fuel, right? I mean, it doesn't matter because the, what you really need fuel for is 2% of the vehicle, vehicle's journey, which is uh, almost insignificant. So it, it, the thought process is, and I'm appealing to the startup ecosystem, the OEM ecosystem, everyone, what if you tackle these losses, right? You will instantly end up with taking the 2% number, 50x more my range with the same battery. Right? The, it, it, is a, it is a different thought process that we are not looking at, governments are not looking at. At Ashok Leyland, we have started to look at. Right? We have just formed a team which is saying that it's not about fuel, it's about the other huge things, elephants in the room, which are accounting for 98% of where all the energy, whether it's battery, whether it's hydrogen, whether it's something else, is actually going. So this is a realization that has come from data. And it has been backed up by physics, and it's, it's the truth. And even that 2% can be controlled, can come very close to zero if you have very effective regenerative braking, for instance. Right? So the 2% is just traffic conditions, poor roads, bad driving habits, those kinds of things. Right? And it can be, in theory, close to zero. And I know I'm talking a little bit about ideality, but I think when we innovate, we have to start from an ideality and work backwards to figure out where the innovation has to come from. Right? So today, region efficiency, I'm talking commercial vehicles, is about 10 to 20%, which means 80% of the braking energy is still lost. Right? So we are already working on interesting region technologies that can take us to about 60 70%, but not enough. Right? Today, region happens by you run the motor in reverse and you charge the battery. So you have a conversion from kinetic energy to electrical energy to, if you will, chemical energy. And then converting chemical to electrical to kinetic when you press on the accelerator again after the light turns green. Right. So it's such a silly thing to do so many conversions just for a stop at a traffic light. And uh, keeping the energy, mechanical energy, as mechanical is actually already working wonders for regenerative efficiency, which can tackle even that 2%. So the appeal here is, can a, can a startup work on traffic management? Right? I want to go from here to my home without touching my brake. Can a startup work on tire technology, which is miserably inefficient today? Miserably. 40% right? of battery power is going there. Right? The move to electric, something we are doing internally, the 20% pie, which is going to transmissions, Right? The move to electric is giving us an opportunity to nearly eliminate transmission. Eliminate. So for an electric vehicle, at least for smaller vehicles, you don't need a clutch, you don't need a gearbox, you don't need a propeller shaft, you don't need a universal joint. Uh, in theory, in ideality, you can have one motor on the left, one motor on the right. You can have no differential. Right? Your transmission can come down to a piece of wire from the battery to the motor. So you have the opportunity to rethink how a vehicle is built, right? Which to me is leapfrog. Right. So I'll stop with that.
Narsi, I think uh, you said there are more people outside than inside. And, you know, uh, so I'm, I'm pretty sure people sitting here are thinking this old guy will not keep on talking for long. Yeah. It's lunchtime, so I'll, I'll make only one point, which I think uh, my experience all through my 43 years of working life that, first of all, yes, I, it looks to me that the Titanic is sinking. And uh, in the past, the discussions have centered around rearranging the deck. But I think the concept with which this uh, conference is happening, which is essentially uh, bringing startups involved in this area, is the way to go. I'll, I'll just uh, explain that. I've been working with green technologies all my life. And the one thing which I have seen repeatedly in various kinds of products and uh, technologies which uh, I and my team tried to commercialize, unless you can offer something which is economically competitive, it is not going to be practiced. It is not going to be bought. So, Subsidies, support, policies, in my view, is not going to achieve the change management which Professor Junjunwala spoke about today. If the change management is not done properly, the Titanic will sink. So my view is, including what Satya said about leapfrog, is all about technological approaches to making solutions which is going to be cheaper than what is available today. If you have to beat the oil companies, you have to come out with solutions which are going to be cheaper than what they are offering today. In my view, is that's the only way we're going to stop uh, the Titanic from sinking. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, all of you. As I uh, promised right in the beginning, I am not going to play the role of the moderator. My job is just the questioner. To ask the question, listen to you guys, and this is a discussion. It's a pity that we have to actually have only about 30 minutes. I think the insights were very good. We could have had a long debate on this. We could have had questions. It's a pity that we need to break now. But I, I, I'm going to take one keyword from each of you. Uh, I hope I'm correct. Mrudula, the keyword I take from her is adaptation. From uh, Satya, of course, leapfrog. It stays in our mind. From, uh, from Subramaniam, rethink. And from Sivram, economic. Now, do this answer many questions? Perhaps no. But I'm hoping at least it started um, seeding, uh, putting some seeds in the few people who are brave enough to remain inside while all everybody else is outside. I hope that you start thinking about this. I think it's a very important question, the Titanic if we believe what the climate scientists say, what IPCC says, is sinking. Right? Unless you belong to that 1% of scientists who think climate change is um, a fraud, I think the 99% of the world thinks the Titanic is sinking. Do we have answers? It looks like we do not right now. But maybe there are some pathways. That's what I hear from all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Why don't we stand for a group photograph? It will be my privilege to be along with you guys.